All righty. So welcome, 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 everyone. My name is Mark Caesar, and welcome to Financial Freedom through Apartment Investing, a proud affiliate of the GOB Network of Apartment Investors. And tonight, I have the honor of having Rodney Robinson II as our guest speaker. Um, Rodney, I think I'll let you dissect your bio okay. and list the bullet points. I think you'll do it more justice than I can. Yeah, um, I don't have it in front of me, but thankfully it's my story, so that'll be easy. And I, I actually have the honor. I really appreciate, Mark, you letting me uh, join the conversation today, but here's the story for me. <clears throat> so I've been interested in real estate for quite a bit of time. I've been a working professional since 2012 uh, when I graduated from UCF in Orlando. Um, at that time, I was sometime in between, you know, 2010 and 2011, I was in student housing as a leasing agent at one of the largest student housing properties at UCF. Um, and that was pretty much what gave me some exposure to multifamily, except I didn't realize how the puzzle pieces were going to work together until later. Um, so I just did the thing that I knew to do, get my degree. I had a marketing degree. I got into my field, which is supply chain and in the aerospace and defense industry, Corey, you and I were talking about space, Kesha, same. Um, and I, I've been doing that. I've been in that industry since 2012, working in supply chain, growing up as a working professional. And that's actually who I market towards. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but basically in 2013, I said, there's gotta be some way for me to, uh, to grow well and not just depend on income. So I started reading and I came across Bigger Pockets, started listening to those podcasts. And um, it took me about six years of contemplating to buy a rental property. So there was some delay there. We were putting some things in order, my, my wife and I growing a family, everything like that. But there never re really is a great time to start. Um, there are always going to be hurdles. But what happened was that law, the first deal happened. And shortly after fixing up our first rental property and making it a single family <clears throat> rental, we ended up moving out of the house that we were in and making that a second rental. And I said, this is awesome in 20, 2020, but I don't want to do it again. I don't want to mess around with single families anymore. The truth is I will, but I'm focusing on multifamily because I like you know, all the reasons we like multifamily, you know, being able to do one transaction versus 20 and have 20 doors. And um, so that's where I've been focusing. And I started uh, Robinson Capital in 2020. I started a blog. We'll talk about the platform I use to, to inform others and potentially meet passive investors. And um, where I am today is I have a blog that's catching traction. I'm meeting great people such as yourself and I'm learning. And I'm getting ready to do my first limited partner deal um, this year. And I'm just thankful. I'm just really thankful to grow. So I do have a presentation I'll show, if that's okay, Mark. Um, sure, sure. I, you should have um, sharing capabilities. Yep. Yeah. So I'll do that. You might not see my face. I already tried to do it before this meeting. You'll see my profile Zoom face, but I'm still here talking. So you'll see me <laughs> afterwards. Um, so give me a second. You should see me going through stuff. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we're good. All right. All right. So far, I didn't mess it up. Let's go. So I'm talking about capital raising and reaching your avatar. So let me remind you, I have not done a syndication yet. I'm in the process of growing and positioning myself for doing that, but I haven't done it yet. This is my journey. Very thankful for where I am. I'm looking forward to crossing that, what I say is the bit, the start line and the finish line of getting my first, um, you know, taking down my first apartment as a GP. But you have to, you have to crawl before you walk, before you run. And one thing that I learned when I went to um, my first conference last year was you need a platform. So I'm not sure if you have a platform you know, you may not consider yourself a capital raiser. My belief is if you're doing what you're doing, anyone you touch with, anyone you come into contact with, they should know what you're doing and what you're working on. Um, so I push myself to let people know what I'm working on. And 
And here is how I do that. I kind of talked a little bit about me, but what I'll do is I'll highlight the goals for this conversation, but also the goals that we identified as raising capital. I, I use that word effortlessly. We know it's not effortlessly, but I do understand what happens when you gain momentum. And I'll share a little bit of that. And I have some examples. I make it really personal. So hopefully you find it exciting. <clears throat> and then also some lessons that I'm learning along the way. Some things I've already put in place. Other things I have not because it's hard, but I'll tell you about it. So what we'll talk about when we talk about raising private capital is one, knowing the rules. Two, identifying your target market. Then how you create a platform to reach your audience. And then maintaining some sort of database for those people that you're meeting for your passive investors, potential passive investors. And then something that I think is the most important, if you don't do this, you know, it, it almost renders everything else ineffective, nurturing leads and that passive investor relationship. And I'll give you a hint, this is one of those hard things that I'm trying to do right now. Um, before I get started, are there any questions? And just out of curiosity, can you see my face? Or is it just no, we can. no, we just see your slides. Okay. That's all right. I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> all right. So this one is, I think it's really important before you play any game to understand the rules, not what you can do, but what you can't do. I think that's the first place to start. You know, when you play Monopoly and you don't know the rules, you know, the stakes are very low. But when you're talking about what we're doing, which is raising private capital, it could be dangerous and devastating if you don't follow the rules and you find out the hard way because the SEC does not care if you didn't know that. You didn't know you couldn't do that. So I, I hit a few points here about the regulations for raising capital and exemptions. Um, I'll skip to the bottom first, I, or the, the second point first. I recommend, if you have not read this book, to read it. It's an amazing book. It's by an attorney, syndication attorney named Kim Lisa Taylor. I think she's in Florida and she's pretty well known in what we do. And she breaks it down, tells you what you, what you can't do, what you can't do, what you should look at. Um, a few points to remember, some things that you want to know are what those exemptions are to raising private capital. Normally, you have to you know, file, um, but there are exemptions such as 506B and 506C, 506B, which is called the friends and family um, you know thing where you already have a pre-existing and substantive relationship with others and you're able to um, talk to them about opportunities. The, the, the struggle there is you can't market, which, which, which is what makes the 506C very attractive to, uh, to people that want to get their name out there and share deals. The downside there is you have to be able to vet accredited investors and show, you know, if you're potentially, you know, audited or reviewed that you you go through a, you know, your due diligence of vetting accredited investors. So anyway, I'll keep it very simple. There's a resource here from the SEC website, which is very um, useful. Um, but if you're talking about syndicating apartments, whether you call yourself a capital raiser or not, or not, I recommend that you understand some of the basic requirements and rules because that's just how the game works and you have to know the rules. And you can, you can interrupt me anytime. Mark, if you see questions or something in the Zoom chat, you know, don't hesitate sure. to interrupt me because um, I, I would like to make it interactive as possible. <clears throat> but here's where I kind of talk about the marketing. Maybe it came from my background in marketing. I don't think I'm naturally good at it. I think once I start getting some momentum, I do get passionate about it. But the question is, you know, who is your target market? If you're talking about, you know, raising private capital, it's not going to be everyone. And if you think it's everyone, you're going to be on, you're going to be on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you're going to be talking to anyone and everyone. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't and always work that way. I know if you're like me, you want to be everywhere. You want to be like Amazon and Google, but even those great companies target. So who is your avatar? And, and the avatar means if you could put a name and a face on your ideal audience, target market, who would that be? So here's some things to think about. 
what is his or her name? How old is he or she? Where does he or she live? What do they do for a living? And what are their needs and goals? What problem are you trying to solve? What problems do they believe that they have? And a second, I'll give you an example for me and what I'm doing and, and why it's helped me so much. Um, but the second point is focus on the, that, that piece, that target market and that approach for the basis of all your marketing. So keep it very simple and targeted. I'm trying to teach myself this right now. You know, I have two Instagram accounts. I have a LinkedIn account. I just started a Facebook account. It can drive you crazy. But I'm going to tell you some things that I believe make this very simple. Um, so stop counting your LinkedIn followers and even your email list and look for quality over quantity. Here's an example. So I started a meetup back in um, probably August 2020 in my area. And it was gaining traction, but it wasn't my target market. So I called the meetup um, real estate investing for working professionals. And, you know, it just ended up with a different audience. And I, I decided maybe at the end of 2020, let's just put this on hold. I'm going to focus on some other more effective, you know, uh, strategies. And I'll get back to that, but I want it to work. So if you feel like you're not reaching your target market, try something different. Um, between the message and the channels. I'm going to slow down. Are there any questions there? All right, cool. I was taking a sip of water. So here's an example for me. This is, I made this up this weekend, but it was a good exercise for me. Who is my avatar? I was trying to think of a name that wasn't too common, like Michael Jones or Johnson or something. So I call him Dylan Jacob. What's more important than his name, although his name is very important, is what I believe, you know, the mold is the mold of this person. So I said, he's a project engineer. Let's say he's 38 and he's got some savvy. I mean, he's looking at his 401k. He's looking at his stocks. He's trying to grow in his career. But I said, what are his needs? And these are the people that I've met throughout my career and my time at the various companies that I've worked at. Um, seeking financial freedom through passive investing outside of his career. These people are working hard. He wants a promotion. He wants to grow. He wants um, meaningfulness in his life. And he's pr pretty darn good at what he does. And when he, when he thinks of real estate investing, he might think of what he sees on HGTV. So the Property Brothers, Chip and Joe, you got to get a hammer, you got to, you know, or even the Mist, where you have to answer the phone at 3 a.m. and um, clean toilets, fix toilets. But I believe a lot of people are mistaken when, when they think of real estate investing. And this is my target market. I want them to understand that there are options outside of their 401k and why I believe even though 401k is good, there are some other ways and probably better ways to plan for your life versus hoping you your 401k outlasts you. Basically, you die before your 401k. So I know those are strong words, but these this is how passionate I am about my avatar. So other examples, I know there are people that are doctors that are real estate investors and they're raising private capital from others in the medical industry. I know that there are people in the military that do the same thing. Their target is people just like them. So think about it, you know, take some time to think about who your avatar is. You know, if you're an engineer, are you looking for other people just like you? If you're in a certain field, you know, are you trying to help other people escape or, or get some, you know, grow, grow their wealth through another means such as real estate? But any questions there? Okay, so creating a platform to reach your audience. And Mark, this may sound familiar. I'll tell you, I learned a lot of this just from listening to Michael, Michael Blanc's podcast. Um, <clears throat> he talks about the platform religiously. And he says, if you have a website, don't think you have a platform. If you have an Instagram page, don't think it's a platform. So there are more platforms than simply podcasts, videos, and blogs. The goal altogether is you become a thought leader. So what you're probably feeling is a little bit of anxiety because you're like, how am I a thought leader if I'm just doing this thing? Every day I feel that, by the way. 
every single day. I'm like, I'm putting out a blog post or I'm talking to somebody and I haven't done it myself. They call that imposter syndrome. Stick with it, continue learning. And then through that medium, you either invite other people to talk about the content that you plan to put out with you on a podcast or you make videos or blog, or you just talk about what you're doing that other people can learn from. So as long as you know something that, that is a little bit more than your target audience, you are in the right place. So I chose a blog personally, nothing against podcasts, but I, knew, I do know that they are a lot of work and I wanted to be consistent. That's the third point. Whatever you choose, keep it coming. Don't stop. You're going to want to stop. Um, I had a blog before a long time ago for marketing stuff. And every time I wanted to write a post, I wrote a post and then I released it and I, it drove me nuts. So I did something different with this podcast. I, I write not podcast with this blog. I write every, just about every weekday. So I'll tell you where I am with that later. But when you have this platform, you want to encourage signups. I'm going to ask you if anyone wants to, to guess, why is it important that you get a sign up? Someone to and sign up on email. your website. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Is that Patrick? Yes. Yep. All right. And then what happens when you get their email address? Then uh, you can do more of a drip campaign. It's more communications oh, yeah. to them. Yeah, exactly. So now that you have their email, you can continue to hold that conversation with them. There's more that you could offer them. And in our case, per, potentially you can convert somebody to a passive investor. Um, so I have some really cool examples I'm gonna show you in a second, but I'll, I'll start with my platform. <clears throat> so I started this blog, July, 2020. It's not the prettiest. Um, and there are probably some errors somewhere in the content. If you look hard enough, you'll find it. Um, in the future, I do wanna have a team but this is where I am. This is my journey. And I encourage you, no matter what you start, to just put it out there. Um, and I'll get back to that. But I put out new posts Mondays and Wednesdays. Soon it'll be Mondays and Thursdays because I learned that those two days are too close to each other. I share it on social media, LinkedIn and Instagram. And I give away something brand new as of a few weeks ago, which is the Passive Investor Guide. Because I've written so much, I've been able to give away basically a report or a guide that's nearly 50 pages. I'm not bragging about that. I think it's good content and it's got, it's like a five part guide. I think there's a lot more I can put in it, but I decided let's just put this out there. And like I said, if you look hard enough, you might find some errors in that. And I'm also a guest blogger on uh, someone I know who has a website that is an active uh, syndicator. So I've been doing that. I've been doing a lot of writing. The point I'm making here is not to put myself on, you know, a platform of my own, but to encourage you to just get started, find the means that works best for you and don't try to be a perfectionist. Otherwise you'll never get it out there. Here's an example. When I started my blog, I, uh, I had to basically rewrite everything because I used a very terrible service. And maybe there was a better way to do it, but I, I had to restart that thing a few months. I had blog posts out, but I said, I need to use this particular company, this particular service and these features. So I started over and it was frustrating, but I knew in the long run it, you know, since I had just started with this website, I had time before things started to index and it really impacted me. So just get out and make mistakes and learn from others' mistakes. The last thing I'll say about the blog for me is I'm probably better suited right now with my schedule for writing. You saw in the first page, I have four children. My wife and I are very busy. I'd love to be able to do a podcast, um, but I figured I could show up on other people's podcasts and just work on writing early in the morning, which is what I do. Um, and then I figure there's probably an audience, my audience that being remote, they may prefer to read a five minute article versus listen to a 30 minute art, uh, podcast. Um, you know, everyone's different, but maybe people aren't commuting as much and there's some benefit to them being a little bit distracted at work reading my, my, my blogs. Just kidding, hopefully they're focusing on what they're doing. 
<laughs> Any questions there? All right, so. I say, um, I, I do have a question. Um, Go for it. Rodney. Hi, um, my name is Greg. Um, thank you so hey, much Greg. for actually uh, presenting that. And I apologize, I was a, bit, a little bit late, but okay. I heard enough. And I'm, um, and so as an individual, I'm, I'm actually looking at starting, um, starting uh, actually a podcast, and which is something I was interested in doing before. Um, my, my my current coaching and my current coaching is um yeah he's he's great and he's 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 um yeah he agrees that I should start a podcast because it's one thing I'm I've been passionate about anyways. Um, sure. And how, one of the challenges I currently find is that. Um, I guess I'm maybe an acid paralysis where I don't think I have everything I need to start. Mm -hmm. What was what were some of the main main hurdles you had to jump over before you can actually take that leap and say, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it happen. Thank you, Greg. That's a really good question. And I'm glad you asked. <clears throat> so um, I knew that there were probably more hurdles for a podcast, and that's me personally. But I still had quite a few hurdles for the blog. Um, and the first one is kind of along the lines of what you said, analysis paralysis. What's the best hosting service? What's the best website name? What's the best, you know, uh, software for a blog? And it did cost me because I had to redo it, like I said. But I just, I knew that it, it, I wasn't going to be confident that I'm putting something out there consistently and that this is a real thing until I started. So I decided the most important thing was to start um, to answer your question simply, I just think all the resources necessary to make it happen were, were going to be the hurdles. But the bigger hurdle has always been mentally, because um, if you're like me, you're constantly asking yourself, is this good enough? So mm -hmm. the, if you're thinking about starting a podcast, maybe you're thinking, is this good enough? And it is a good question to ask, because there are quite a few podcasts out there. I do know that they're not going to be, some aren't going to be around tomorrow. So you want to be one of those that not only stick around, sticks around, but thrives. So, mm -hmm. you know, what is, what is it that makes you different? Here's something that makes me different. I'm targeting most uh, professionals. I started. Um, so when I say professionals, working professionals, I started talking personally about some of the things that I'm doing, such as refinancing houses, got a property manager, it's my own story that can't be taken away. So that's unique. So with your podcast, something you should consider a hurdle if you haven't is what makes you different. And I know you have something, you just have to think about that and expand on it and then just be willing to, to pivot over time as you need to. One example is someone I know has a podcast for, what's it called? I don't know what it's called, but they target um, married couples that are investing in real estate. And I think that's really awesome. So that's what I would say. You know, try not to overthink it with the resources. Just get started. And then secondly, um, make yourself different. Rodney, you are, you are absolutely right. Um, because um, I, I've, I've been stuck in finding names. And um, um, so, so some, of, some of the guys, great guys, have, have ideas. And I'm like, okay, I can run with this. And then. I said, okay, maybe not. Maybe would this work? Would it would this work mm -hmm. for my for, for the audience I'm trying to hit? Because yep. my my target audience is is military, but then is military and medical because that's that's why that's why I've done. Okay. Um, and so I I initially wanted a name that that fits that, but then I also tend to be a guy who asks a lot of questions, as you can see. So mm -hmm. <laughs> so some idea that this the guy that had was something something in line of of answering questions for folks. But after thinking yeah. about it, I said, I said, okay, how does that hit me answering questions for um, having my military folks, my medical yeah. folks, knowing that this is for them? Yep. And I'll say this before I go to the next slide. Um, think about how much time you took thinking about it. I don't know. It could mm -hmm. have been a few weeks, could have been a few months, and how far you could have been by now. And it's not to condemn you at all, because I do this all the time. There's probably mm -hmm. something I should do right now that I've been thinking about for a while. But the point I'm making is that's, that's, that's where you need to get started. So tell yourself in a week or in two weeks or on such and such date, I don't care if I have everything I have or not, I'm going to make a terrible podcast. Okay. <laughs> um, that's a good idea. And, and just, just put out a terrible podcast. 
I mean, not everyone okay. will agree, but I just, I know I've done it. I put out stuff I wasn't, I, I, that I look back and it, it's not all that, but it's moving forward. And I know it's adding value to somebody. All right. Okay, so no problem. Here's the point. Another thing, you know, like I said, I'm on my journey. I haven't done a syndication myself, but I got some pretty cool opportunities, just like the one I have to talk to you guys right now. Um, and so here's some podcasts that I've been on and I'm not sharing it just so you can see the podcasts I've been on. The point is all of this was nerve wracking, every single one. The one on the top right, that was my first podcast with Barry Griffiths. He's someone I know now. And um, I'm like, why does he want to talk to me? I don't have anything to offer. And then the second one, I broke my over to the top left. I broke my Apple watch right before that one, but I had to push through. And this, this bottom one, I, I considered to be one of the coolest opportunities I had because this person actually inspires me. This is Whitney Sewell. He does a daily podcast every single day. Um, and he's always putting together content and interviewing people. He's got a set schedule and someone on his team reached out to me for an interview opportunity. And you, you best believe I was very nervous. But the point of me sharing all this is because these are your opportunities to become known. Put yourself out there. And if it fits, say yes to every single opportunity. Now, I know sometimes you won't be able to go to every single opportunity. I can't go to every single meetup because I have kids and dinner times at a certain time. I need to get to bed. The point I'm making is you may feel ill-equipped, but people reached out to you because they believe that you you have something of value. So it's amazing that other people believe in you when you don't believe in yourself, but it's time to start believing in yourself. And I'm talking to myself right now, too. So I want to talk a little bit about the, let's see how much time we have. How are we looking on time, Mark? You can be honest with me. Are we over? Um, we're good. So what we're going to do is just uh, let's hold off the questions um, until the Q&A okay. Q sessions so you can you know get through your slides. and Got it. Got to be more. And I, I think we have just a few more slides, so I'll make sure I, I cover what we need to and any other questions we'll uh, yeah. All right, so this is what I believe is key. This is one of the reasons you do this. And this isn't to overwhelm you. This took some time. The number one thing is don't make it complicated. If it's a spreadsheet right now, put a list of everyone you know. And the reason you do that is like Patrick said, is so that you can start to develop relationships. Online marketing is still very effective. And I'm learning this. So develop systems, there are different tools. There's MailChimp, free, active campaign. Um, I, I started paying for that. There's HubStop, I think they have a free, um, a free service, but these are really great tools. The reason I switched from MailChimp, a free service to active campaign is because I can now automate. That means when someone signs up for my website, they automatically get an email and then they get something else a little bit later. And I'm, I'm playing with that right now. So what you see here is just a screenshot from that. And it's not necessarily a plug for active campaign. It's not at all actually, but it just shows how cool it is once you start putting systems together. Um, that's for more discussion later. But when you automate some of your newsletter signups and passive investor, let's call them workflows. Someone says they're interested in being a passive investor they get an email from you, they schedule a call. After the call, they get another email. Things start to, to work on their own. I'm not nearly where it sounds like I am. I'm just scratching the surface. What you'll see in the bottom left, that screenshot with the little circle, this is someone that just signed up on my website. They automatically went to a list called the monthly newsletter and a blog. And from now on, they get all my blog updates until I figure out how I can start to have conversations with them. So that, that's something that's next step for me. <clears throat> and something I'm, I'm passionate about now, these are screenshots of actual conversations I've had because of the, the content that I'm sharing from the website um, on social media. These are people that I know through previous relationships, through my work relationships, which is why it's so important that you choose your target market carefully. You know, like I said, working professionals, one's a VP of, you know, a legal 
vice president, another's a program manager. I'm not sure if I blocked all the blacked out all the right stuff. So you might find out their name. But the point I'm making here is they reached out to me. They wanted to have a conversation. So both of these people said they're interested in being passive investors in the future. And so even without systems, all it, I mean, this was social media and a website. You can get that. You can get those leads, but you have to be brave. You have to do what, what you'll see on this right side, follow through. And that's something that I'm really working on. So how do we do that? You know, there's a monthly newsletter, um, different things that you can do. But the point is, when people reach out to you, take the opportunity. And I'll share these slides if, we, if you guys are interested. Here's the last slide. This is, these are the lessons learned. <clears throat> these are things that I've learned or I'm learning and I'm doing or need to do. So I'm, you know, capital raising, all this has to do with capital raising, but that, you know, in general, you know, putting in the work up front. So I believe it was you, Greg, you asked about some of those things that hold you back to get started. Yeah, you know, plan, do make it happen. But as you're making it happen, start putting some things together that make, you know, your, what you're doing reputable and answer the questions up front. So it's just some time that goes into building the platform, such as doing a sample deal, a company presentation. And you'll learn after you start getting questions, the questions that you now want to start answering so that they don't have those same questions. And then if there's one thing that I would say we should remember to do, it's follow through. So this is that thing that I know I need to do that I'm not doing. I have people right now in my list that say they are willing to invest and I really have not nurtured that relationship and it's bothering me. So this week, I'm going to start picking up the phone and I'm going to start calling people and it's hard because you don't have a deal, but you want to make sure they're still interested. So picking up the phone, remember that doesn't take sophisticated technology and just saying, how are you doing? How's, how's your journey going? How are your goals happening? Do you have any questions for me? Here's what I'm working on. You could also do that in a monthly newsletter, which is why those email lists are so valuable. Um, and then on the right side, reaching your target audience. It's what we talked about earlier. Know who you're talking to. Because um, if you don't know who you're talking to, you know, the vision's not there and, and you're just hoping. And then be consistent. That's the second most important point. Be consistent. And then um, let's just say, I don't remember. I, I said we had a few important points. Let's say the very important, the most critical point here is using your voice because we all do if we're here on this call we know that we're passionate about you know multifamily real estate for whatever reason maybe it's the legacy for ourselves it's helping other people meet their goals maybe we just want to share people with people how valuable you know the concept of wealth creation from real estate is be bold and talk about it and you will learn those things you have to do better in the future but let yourself make mistakes be passionate and take others on a journey. So be a leader and let people follow you, but you have to lead first. So I know that was a lot, but I think I'll stop there. Well, thank Any questions? you. I actually do have a question for you, Rodney. So I'm, I actually had a call, an interesting call today when I, where I was learning about prospecting uh, for capital raising where you build your investor database. Now, how do you typically prospect to your, to your avatar, to your customer avatar? Do you, you know, just go out and just pitch or do you have, do you single them out and, uh, you know, have that conversation and, you know, run down your script? I'll tell you this. <clears throat> it was, it was probably easier than I expected for me because I had a LinkedIn account already from my work and relationships. And I had over 500 LinkedIn connections. And because of that, um, all I had to do was talk about what I was doing on LinkedIn, but I had to be brave enough to do it because I started worrying about my bosses or people I work with and things like that. So the prospecting, if they were already a LinkedIn connection, I already knew them. 
So think about that if you if you all have you know relationships on LinkedIn or social media that are already there, they're already good fits, work with that. So I really didn't have to do much prospecting. Those two examples I showed you, a program manager and a VP of legal, they were already perfect fits for what I was trying to do. Awesome, awesome. Um, if anyone else have any questions, feel free. This is the Q&A section part. Feel free to ask your questions. <clears throat> yeah, Rodney, I've got a question for you. This is Andy Benz. I'm over here in yes, Michigan. Sir. Hey, Andy. <clears throat> Thanks for the content today. It was really good. I, I was really, right. um, I thought it was really educational. Um, Thank you. Question for you is, you know, you, you're a working professional. I am too. I am, um, you know, and my company is very, integrated with LinkedIn and there's a lot of I'll say our presence there and I also have a lot of connections because of it now how do you how do you um, put your self out there in this other context outside of your work you know like sphere you like this is my work this is what I do and now I have this other personality if you will how do you combine mm -hmm. those yeah. and you know, make it one on that one LinkedIn profile. Yeah, that was that was hard, but I had to look at other examples. And any anybody that, um, by the way, I look at a lot of great examples. I sign up for for um, newsletters for people that are doing exactly what I want to do and are doing it really well. So I use those examples. Like someone made a comment, Whitney's why is awesome. I mean, what he did motivated me. You know, and a lot of the inspiration is from people like that. So to answer your question, Andy, um, those people were one in the same. They were humans. So they were working professionals, or let's say they were professionals, right? Let's say this person's a, an anesthesiologist that invests in real estate. He's, he's a career person, but he's talking about real estate also. So it's okay to do that, I learned, even though it made me very anxious. So now I'm suddenly talking about real estate. Do people think I have a side hustle and I'm doing it during my work hours? But I said, those I'm not going to let potential thoughts step in my way of what I'm trying to do here, especially when they're probably not even happening. Um, and what I realized is that more than anything, it was facilitating conversation. Now I'm seeing people like the content and sign up that I, I know and recognize. And I would not have had those people on my newsletter or my, my list if I hadn't put it, gone to LinkedIn and got exactly where I didn't want to go. Same profile, supply chain manager, and now I'm talking about real estate. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. That's a good question. It, it's, it's, it's something to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is Greg again, the question guy. Um, hey, Greg. Question guy. Hey. <laughs> um, I I am um I won't say old school, but I um I'm still not a large big on social media, and um in terms of um of checking it daily, responding um regularly, um any idea whether yourself or anyone else um um especially those of us who are, who are over forty who are now very well versed in 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 responding to social media like like I guess we ought to. Any ideas of how to actually be able to engage that on a regular basis and what is actually uh, an ideal time frame um, um, interval to actually be, be able to, to engage and I'll tell you very simply, <clears throat> whether you're doing this for business or you're doing it for entertainment, um, it can consume you. So in my head, I told myself, try to be a producer of content and not a consumer because what happens as a consumer, I guess, I mean, I know we're causing other people to consume, hopefully they're being healthy themselves. But what happens is as a consumer, um, you get distracted, you know? You're always checking your likes, you're always checking your comments. So what I actually don't do much as much is scroll. So I have a plan when I get on, what I'm trying to do next level to keep me off even more is start creating systems where some of my content automatically goes out because that that is some work on you know in preparation 
But if anything, think of yourself as a producer and what value is it adding with you? Maybe there's a time you call learning time where you follow someone who just put out a really good article or a post or a podcast. That's where you're actually getting some education. But otherwise, if you don't have a goal, it can consume you and you think you're, you're growing your business and you're just consuming information and it's, it's overwhelming. Completely true. And I mean, that's what I'm trying to avoid. I see so many people yeah. waste so much time on social media and it, it becomes very counterproductive yeah. if you don't balance it right. It can be. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a journey for me too, trying to do the same. Good questions, guys. Uh, does anyone else have any um, other questions or thoughts you guys want to share? Nah, it's a great, great work, Rodney. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Corey. You're, you're good, hey, Patrick. Patrick. Um, oh, yeah, it's yeah. a great, great presentation. Thanks a lot for putting that together. What part of it do you enjoy the most? Do you enjoy the marketing pieces, writing the content, or talking to, uh, to prospects? So um, <clears throat> I actually don't like social media very much, if you can tell from my answer to Greg, but it, you need it. You know, it's like you have to deal with it. You have to do it. Um, the part I think I like the most is this part, you know, talking to people. And I think in general with real estate, I like sharing with others what they don't know. I didn't grow up knowing exactly what you can do as a real estate investor and that you, you could have a day job and grow wealth or that you don't need to put your money in a bank and save it, save your way to being a millionaire. You know, you can have money working harder for you than you're working in your day job. And as someone with, you know, young children, you know, I feel like I'm sweating. So I'd like for the, for the passive income to be there. I know that there are other people that, you know, that need to know the same, just so at least it's, they know that it exists out there and it's not just for the wealthy. Um, and there are people with quite a bit of money in their 401k. They don't know about rolling over their funds into a self-directed IRA or an EQRP. So to answer your question, Patrick, I think, you know, what, what's most passion is just educating others. What That's I'm most great, passionate man. about is educating others. Yeah. Yep. Keep telling your story. Doing a great job. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I appreciate it. Rodney, <clears throat> how you yes, doing? Yes, sir. Hey, Daryl. All right. I just said, how much of your, uh, with everything that you're doing, how much time do you dedicate to underwriting deals? That's a good question because there was a while uh, when I first started, I was underwriting deals all the time. And then I started writing all these blog posts and I started feeling like I didn't even know, I couldn't, just didn't know a good deal if I saw it. So in the mornings, I did a lot of writing for a long time, for months. And now I switched it up. So mornings are me looking at deals and in the evenings is, so I call it, let's say uh, business execution or something. And then in the evenings, I call it business planning or content production. And that's me writing, even though in the mornings I'm fresher for writing, I just need to do more of that. And I was talking to someone who's kind of like a mentor to me. If I'm, if you're getting at where I think you're getting at, he said, you can be, you have to be careful because you can find yourself being a, I forgot what he called it. Let's just say a, um, a production company and, and not a real estate company. So you do have to be careful. You know, the reason we're here is because we want to be real estate investors. And, you know, one way to do that is to raise capital. But some people do get so sucked into the podcast and the blog and the social media, like we were talking about, Greg. So to answer your question, now it's about half my time. Yeah. And, and how many deals would you say you write on a daily basis. I know you said in the morning, I, I yeah. know you said that, but how many deals would you say that you write, underwrite in the mornings? One deal maybe or two or? I'd morning. say right now one, I'm, I'm just getting back to it. Okay. So my goal is to do one every morning and I'm trying to make sure I, I, I don't do it for quantity. I'm doing it to really go through and you know what, what doesn't stand right here? What questions would I ask? And I know that I'm going to look at quite a few before something even makes sense. Right now, it's an exercise for me. You know, I'm moving forward. I'm, you know, going to be passively investing in something. And when it's time for me to put together deals with other people, I, I need to have that skill set. Um, so right now, it's kind of an exercise for me. And I do like one, one every morning. 
Yeah. Would you would you say that with everything that you have going on, since you only underwrite maybe one deal a day, do you also look at maybe working with others on their deals and and getting on their deals in, instead? Yeah, that's a big strategy. That's why, you know, for me, the capital is a key asset. I think I have some skills that make me good for raising capital mm -hmm. and other people, no matter how hard I do it, are some pretty good capital, sorry, uh, pretty good underwriters. Right. Um, I just want to know for myself what a good deal looks like. I want to go, go through and practice myself and the networking, like what I'm doing now um, with others that know that, that are finding deals. Um, is going to be a valuable opportunity for me too. So I, I'm trying to be a specialist right now. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. No, so it's I, good, Daryl. So I do have a question for you in regards to um, what Daryl just mentioned. So again, um, today I learned that it's good to really focus your attention on one thing and not be diverse. Whereas, and the analogy that was used was, you know, in football, you can't play offense and defense at the same time. So either you're mm. good at one, good at the other. In your opinion, do you think that it is crucial, or it is well, it is crucial to learn to to do the underwriting if your strength is capital raising, or if your um how can I put it? If your yeah, pretty much, or if you're yeah. focusing on capital raising, or yeah. Or, um, and, you know, focus on capitalism and, and opposed to underwriting. So I'd like to know what others think, but I think you can't, you have to be able to know how to underwrite deals. Probably more so than even raising capital. But you're going to be limited as you start to grow. And I'm thinking about tomorrow, the next, the, the future deals and people I want to be in my network for opportunities over and over again. So to answer your question is, I, I think the answer is both. Um, because you have to understand the business and you have to understand what makes good opportunities, good opportunities. Just like if you've never passively invested in a deal, it will be hard if, to, to sell to passive investors not saying you can't a lot of people do it but i knew for me personally i wanted to know you know uh, what the journey feels like and soon i'll be able to talk about that and be able to answer questions even better as a as someone who's done it so i think being able to to do both is really important but you do have to be decide what is where is it that you're the best fit well put well put you know one of the next things for me is being a team player so starting to think more about how I don't do everything myself and put together a team so we're all doing something that we're good at and it's adding value and it's moving towards our goal awesome. Rodney, now where do you these deals that you're practicing on writing on where do you get them from? so right now um Patrick, you'll find this interesting. I've been looking a lot at whatever Charles sends out, like old emails. And being on those calls with him has been really good because I, I, I hear his voice. Um, <clears throat> so I look at, you know, that's why I get on, get on good people's newsletters and email lists. Get on meetups. Get on, um, you know, some people you don't know but you like on their newsletter. And, and follow them. So I even look at people who probably didn't do the right thing but threw me on their email list and they're offering me deals i'm looking at why they think what they're offering is a good deal so to answer your question is i look at anything and everything i go to broker websites i i download the the oms i i i put in my tool and i start plugging in numbers so just a lot of practice i think you know moving slowly and just understanding you know, those little details and what you would ask and what you should ask and what would make it a good deal are, are probably good places to start. Okay. Thanks, Rodney. Yep. Good questions. Awesome. So 
if anyone, if no one else has questions for Rodney, does anyone else have any other inputs or questions? So Mark, I'm, oh, sorry, was someone gonna say something? Oh, me, uh, Kayla. Sorry, Kayla, Hi. go ahead. Um, so I have experience with marketing. I used to um, run a trade group on Discord and I guess um, uh, I felt like the marketing can sometimes be a little too time consuming. And I guess what are some tips and tricks you have so you don't feel the burnout as much? Because, um, you know, coming up with new posts, because I had a post every day. Um, so coming up with posts like five days a week to try and attract, you know, potential um, subscribers, that was very daunting and time consuming and stressful. So what are some things that you do to sort of, you know, prevent the burnout? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think consistency is more than anything. And in, in my life, you know, I guess the analogy is I know you can't run on a treadmill for 10 miles an hour permanently. So I think what was most important for me is how consistently can I produce content? And for a while, it was once a week, there was a blog post. And I said, you know what? I might be able to do this twice because I've written a lot of blog posts. And now it's twice a week. But the only reason I'm able to do that is because I have content that goes out for the next year. And I just think planning what you, uh, what, what you can do is probably the best way to do it versus the quantity, which is every week, every, sorry, every, a few times a day, every day. Um, you don't want to get too consumed in it because I think if you do it right, let's just say this. I think the people that have signed up for my newsletter signed up after seeing me out there consistently and didn't just do it every day. Um, so they, they saw that I posted for the last, you know, twice a week for the last, you know, few months, and now they're finally signing up. And I was only able to do that because I didn't commit to something aggressive, like getting on social media and putting up a story every, you know, few hours. Does that help? It does, it definitely does. Okay. Um, so yes, thank you. <laughs> no problem. So guys, I I just want to thank Rodney again for jumping on. I know you probably have to head out and deal with the family. I so do. I thank you for taking the time out to educate us on and sharing your journey and you know educating us on what you're doing and how we can be better uh, capital raisers in a sense. And again, the platform is always welcome for you whenever you want to jump on and share something, you want to share a success story, feel free to you know shoot me an email and the platform is always open to you, sir. That's awesome. I, I really appreciate that. And thank you guys for making it fun. And, you know, it was supposed to be motivating. So just think about what your next steps are. And I think the most important thing is just be brave. You know, if you're doing something you're not comfortable doing, then you're probably doing maybe you're doing the right thing, but you just have to push through that. So thanks. All right, we'll definitely touch base offline, Rodney. All right. Thank you, Rodney. Appreciate Later, it. Later, guys. Thank All right. You. All right.